Yes, hello there. So today again, let's look at our chemistry from two paper and let's begin from the first question. So the first question is asking, the diagram below shows parts of the Bunsen burner as you can see. Uh, that's the diagram whereby we have three parts that have been labeled. So the first question is asking, name the parts labeled A and B. So as you can see in the diagram, we have part A and part B. So what's the name given to part A? So part A is always the chimney. And then part B, whereby the laboratory air the, or the free air inside the laboratory can be able to flow inside the Bunsen burner, that part is always uh, called the air hole. And then we also have part C, whereby part C, it's, all, it's always called the base. That is always the base in the Bunsen burner. Now, in the Bunsen burner, you might be asked, what are the main parts of the Bunsen burner? So the main parts of the Bunsen burner, we have always the chimney, the collar. So this region is the collar whereby we have the air hole. That region is called the collar. And then lastly, we have the base. So those are the three main parts of the Bunsen burner. Remember, we have the chimney, we have the collar, whereby inside the collar, we have the air hole. And then lastly, we have the base. So the next question, which is letter B, is asking, give one use of the part labeled B. So the use of part labeled B, as we had already said, the only use for the air hole is to allow the free flowing air from the laboratory uh, to be able to mix freely with the gas in order to complete the combustion of the flame. So the only function for the part labeled B is to allow free flowing air to enter into the chimney and therefore complete combustion for the flame which is being produced by the Bunsen burner. So remember, in the Bunsen burner, we have how many types of flames? We have two types of flame. So the first type of flame in the Bunsen burner is always the non-luminous flame. And what is the color of the non-luminous flame? So the color of the non-luminous flame is always blue in color. It's always color blue. So the other type of the flame produced by the Bunsen burner, remember, we have the luminous flame. And the luminous flame is always yellow in color. So how does the Bunsen burner produce the non-luminous flame? So it produces the non-luminous flame when that region, which is part B, is open, is fully open. So when the air hole is fully open, the Bunsen burner will produce the non-luminous flame. But when the air hole is tightly closed, meaning that there is no air flowing inside the chimney to complete combustion. So that air hole, when it is closed, it will produce the luminous flame because of incomplete combustion of the laboratory gases. So remember, those are the two types of flames produced by the Bunsen burner. We have the non-luminous flame and the luminous flame. Now let's go to the next question, which is question number two, and it's asking, name two apparatus that are used to measure exact volumes. So this question is so simple and again it's very tricky. So this question is asking the apparatus used to measure exact volume. As you can see the volume has been underlined and also it's in bold. So meaning that that is the key term, the exact volume. So name two apparatus that can be used to measure the exact volume. So the exact volume, they want you to give the apparatus that mainly will measure an exact volume as per the reading that is in the apparatus. Like for example, we have burette. So we can use the burette to measure exact volume because a burette has something like a ruler in order to see exactly the amount of volume that you are requiring. Apart from the burette, we have a 25 ml pipette or a 20 ml pipette. If you only indicate your answer as pipette only, you're going to get it wrong because the question is specific. The question is asking to measure exact volume. So if you only write pipette, your answer will be wrong. So you must be specific and say 25 ml pipette or 20 ml pipette. If you specify like that, that is an exact volume. So the other apparatus we can give, we can give, for example, 20 ml measuring cylinder, we can have 50 ml measuring cylinder, we can have 100 ml measuring cylinder, provided that first of all, you give the value and then the name of the apparatus. Like for example, for the syringe, we also have the syringe, but only saying syringe, we are going to get it wrong. So we must give a value. So we must, uh, we can say 2 ml syringe, or we can say 5 ml syringe is the correct answer. 
Also for the conical flask, if you only say conical flask, you're going to get it wrong. So the best answer to say, you can say 20 ml conical flask or 25 ml conical flask. Also, we have the volumetric flask, but if you say volumetric, remember you are wrong, so you must give it a value. So we can have 50 ml volumetric flask, 20 ml volumetric flask, 10 ml volumetric flask. That's when you're going to get it right. So remember, this question is simple, and again, it is tricky. So the question is asking exact volume, therefore you must give an apparatus that only measures exact volume. So let's go to question number three. Question number three is asking, the diagram below represents a method of separation used to separate two liquids. So as you can see, we have this diagram, and this is a separation technique, which is mainly used to separate two types of liquids. So remember, those two types of liquids we have, we have miscible liquids and we have immiscible liquids. So remember, we have those two types of liquids, the miscible liquids and the miscible liquid. Now, this apparatus is used to separate a type of uh, liquids, whereby it's used to separate immiscible liquids. So, uh, the question is saying, use it to answer the question that follows, obviously. But before we go to the question, you must be able to know that we have three different types of such like apparatus that can be drawn in an exam. So they may be drawn somewhat maybe similar or maybe differently, but the easiest way for you to, say, to differentiate between a thistle funnel, a dropping funnel, and a separating funnel is by checking the position of the taps. So the position of the taps is going to tell you that this is a thistle funnel or a dropping funnel or a separating funnel like as our case. So let's look at the thistle funnel. Now the thistle funnel, remember, it doesn't have a tap. So as you can see, it looks exactly the same as the dropping funnel. So the thistle funnel, remember, it doesn't have a tap. The dropping funnel, on the other hand, looks exactly the same as the thistle funnel, but it has a tap. Now the dropping funnel has a tap, the thistle funnel doesn't have a tap. Now the last one, we have the separating funnel. Now the position of, for you to differentiate between a dropping funnel and a separating funnel, is that the dropping funnel, the tap for the dropping funnel is always found on the top side part, while for the separating funnel, it is always found on the lowest part. That is the only difference to differentiate between a dropping funnel and a separating funnel. So the dropping funnel, the tap, is found on the upper side. The separating funnel, the tap, as you can see on our diagram, is found on the lowest side. Now let's go to the question. The question is asking, name the method of separation uh, shown above. So name the separation method that you can see. So this separation method, this apparatus is called a separating funnel. Now the separation method in this case is using a separating funnel. That is the separation method or the technique used in this experiment. Now the next question is asking, name two properties that make it possible for the two liquids to be separated. So name two properties making it possible for us to separate the two liquids. So it's so simple. This method uses uh, only separates immiscible liquids. Therefore, since it separates immiscible liquid, so the first property under this is that the liquids must be immiscible. So the nature of the solution here plays a very important part, whereby this method can only be used to separate liquids that form two or more layers. That is the immiscible liquid. Now, two or more layers. Now, in this case, the nature of the solution, we see that uh, the solution polarity depends because the first type of solution should not be polarized, meaning that it shouldn't have the positive and the negative terminals, while the next solution must be polarized so that they won't mix. For example, we have water, which is polarized, and we have hexane, or we have kerosene or we have oil which is not which is non-polarized so if you have these two types of liquids the water polarized or something like oil non-polarized therefore they are not going to mix and you are going to separate using this method so the first property is the nature of the solutions the nature of the solutions is one polarized is the next non-polarized so that is the first one the, the nature of the solution 
And then the second one, we have the density of the solution. So the density plays a very important role, whereby the denser liquid or the heaviest liquid is also is always going to be found on the lower part of the separating funnel. And then the less dense liquid is always going to be found floating uh, on top of the, of the denser liquid. So we have those two. We have the nature of the solution, miscible, uh, miscible liquids, and then also we have the density of the solutions. So let's go to the next one, which is letter C, and letter C is asking, give one alternative method that can be used to separate the two liquids. So give one alternative method that can be used to separate these two liquids that are immiscible apart from the separating funnel. So like apart from this separating funnel, which other method can we use to separate immiscible liquids? So we have decantation method. So you can also use decantation method to separate immiscible liquids. So, but remember, separating funnel is always the best method to use in separating immiscible liquids. Anyhow, we can also use decantation method for that process. So let's go to question number four. Question number four is asking, in an experiment, two pieces of iron sheets were wrapped in each case with zinc and the other one was wrapped using copper metals, as you can see. So in an experiment, we took an iron, uh, an iron sheet and then one iron we wrapped it with zinc, the next iron we wrapped it with, uh, with copper sheets. So the following part of the question is asking, they were left in open for several months. So they were left in the atmosphere or in the open for several months. And those are the diagrams as you can see. So question one is asking, state and explain the observations made in experiment one and experiment two. So what are the observations made? Remember, as you can see, the first ion, we have wrapped it with zinc. The second ion, we have wrapped it with copper. Then the question is asking, state the, the observations made in this experiment. Now, the observations made in experiment one is that, in experiment one, the ion sheet did not corrode, or the ion sheet did not rust. But in experiment two, the iron rusted. So in experiment one, the iron did not rust, but in experiment two, the iron rusted. In experiment one, it is coated with zinc. In experiment two, it is only wrapped with copper. So why is it that we are saying that in experiment one, the iron did not rust, but in experiment two, the iron rusted? So this one takes us back to the reactivity series. So if you can be able to remember the reactivity series, we saw that reactivity series begins from potassium and ends with platinum. So platinum is the least reactive metal. For potassium, we see that potassium is the most reactive metal. So in this reactivity series, we can see the position of, the position of iron. So zinc is exactly on top of iron in the reactivity series, while copper is exactly or copper is found way below iron in the reactivity series. So if you can be able to remember the reactivity series, remember we began with potassium, then we went to sodium, calcium, and then after calcium we have magnesium, aluminium, then we have carbon, after carbon we have zinc, iron, and then tin. Tin is the one which has the symbol of SN. After tin we went to lead, after lead we, had, we went to hydrogen, then hydrogen, copper, then we have, um, mm, we have mercury, we have silver, then we have gold, and then lastly, we have now the platinum. So this reactivity series, as you can see, the reactivity series, you see that zinc is found on top of iron in the reactivity series. So this means that zinc is going to react faster than iron. Now in experiment one, the iron was coated with zinc. Now, if we had moisture in the atmosphere, all the moisture reacted with zinc instead of iron. Now, since all the moisture and oxygen reacted with zinc instead of iron, in the first experiment, we see that iron would, uh, or rather, iron did not react with moisture or oxygen. Therefore, all the, uh, all the moisture and oxygen reacted with zinc. Therefore, there was no corrosion of iron. But in the next experiment, experiment number two, we see that uh, iron is more reactive than copper. 
Since iron is more reactive than copper, therefore all the oxygen and moisture in the atmosphere reacted with iron instead of copper. Why? Because iron in the reactivity series, as you saw, iron in the reactivity series is more reactive than copper. Since iron is more reactive than copper, therefore iron is going to react with moisture and oxygen in the atmosphere apart from the copper. And that's why for the answer to this question we say that in experiment one, iron did not corrode, while in experiment two, iron corroded. So remember that if you have been asked such a question, always base your argument on the reactivity series and you're going to get it correct. So the next question is asking, question number five. So given zinc, excess zinc oxide, dilute nitric acid and sodium carbonate in solution form, describe how to prepare zinc carbonate. Now this question of describing how to prepare is coming directly from the topic of salts, whereby here we are going to consider solubility of salts. So remember, all carbonates are insoluble except those ones of sodium, potassium and ammonium carbonate. And also for the nitrates, remember that all nitrates are soluble. So let's begin. How to prepare? Uh, we are going to prepare zinc carbonate. So remember zinc carbonate, we are going to obtain it in uh, in an insoluble form because it's not soluble. So the first step to obtain zinc carbonate, remember we have been given zinc oxide and nitric acid which is dilute. So the first step for this, we are going to add excess of zinc oxide solution to the nitric acid. Now this reaction whereby we are reacting a salt, uh, yeah, we are reacting a base and an acid, is called a neutralization reaction. So in this case, see, we are reacting zinc oxide which is basic and uh, zinc oxide reacting with nitric acid which is acidic. This type of reaction, remember in form one we say that this type of reaction is referred to as neutralization reaction. So if a base reacts with an acid, we are going to obtain salt and water only. So if zinc oxide reacts with nitric acid, we are going to obtain zinc nitrate and water in liquid form. So to balance this equation, now you're in form two, you must know how to balance equation. It's a major necessity. Now to balance this equation, we only add two, uh, we only add two in front of nitric acid and then the equation is balanced. So see, here we have zinc oxide reacting with nitric acid. We are going to obtain zinc nitrate plus water. So remember we say that all nitrates are soluble. Now in this case, remember, zinc nitrate is then soluble in water. So after that, what do we do? Remember we say that we, we, we added excess of zinc oxide. So we added excess of zinc oxide. So it means that if we added excess of zinc oxide, therefore it means that some of the zinc oxide will not react in the reaction. And since this zinc oxide won't react in the reaction, they'll be collected in an insoluble form. So the next step after adding excess of zinc oxide solid to nitric acid, the next step is to filter excess zinc oxide in order to collect them as residue. So we can filter the excess zinc oxide or we can sieve the excess zinc oxide in order to obtain them as residue. Now remember, the liquid or the filtrate that you are going to obtain, remember, is the zinc nitrate filtrate. So the next step, uh, step number three, is that we should filter, or rather, we should react the zinc nitrate or the filtrate. So you should react the filtrate now with sodium carbonate. So remember, the filtrate in this case is zinc nitrate. So after doing all that step, remember the first step we say that we reacted excess of zinc oxide with nitric acid in order to obtain zinc nitrate and water. Therefore, we removed excess of the zinc oxide that did not react. So we removed the zinc oxide as residue and we remained with the filtrate being zinc nitrate. Now with this filtrate being zinc nitrate, we react this filtrate with now the sodium carbonate. Now zinc nitrate is going to react with sodium carbonate and then we are going to obtain zinc carbonate plus sodium nitrate as you can look at the equation. So if we react the filtrate, which was zinc nitrate, plus the sodium carbonate, we are going to obtain zinc, uh, zinc, yeah, it's the zinc carbonate plus sodium nitrate. So 
remember in the solubility of salts in the solubility of salts what did we say we say that all nitrates are soluble and then we also say that all carbonates are insoluble except the carbonates of sodium potassium and ammonium carbonate now in this case look at the products that you're obtaining we're obtaining zinc carbonate plus sodium nitrate so it means that the sodium nitrate is soluble and the zinc carbonate is insoluble because all carbonates are insoluble except sodium potassium and ammonium now in this case our zinc carbonate is insoluble so how do you obtain the zinc carbonate from the sodium nitrate so how to separate this we are going to filter the solution or we are going to filter the insoluble zinc uh, zinc co3 from the sodium nitrate and then what's the last step after filtering the zinc CO3? We are going to wash the zinc carbonate using excess distilled water and then dry using a filter paper. Now those are the steps for preparing the zinc carbonate uh, solid. So remember the first step we said that we reacted excess zinc oxide with nitric acid in order to obtain zinc nitrate plus water. So zinc nitrate is also soluble. So the excess zinc oxide, we removed it or received it out from the, from the solution. Now the filtrate that remained with us, the zinc nitrate, we reacted the zinc nitrate with sodium carbonate in order to obtain zinc carbonate plus sodium nitrate. So since the zinc CO3 is insoluble, therefore we are going again to filter in order to obtain the zinc carbonate and sodium nitrate in separate dishes. So since zinc carbonate is insoluble in water, that is the reason why we washed it with excess distilled water. And then after washing it, we cleaned it or not really cleaning, we dried it using a filter paper or a tissue paper in order to obtain our pure zinc carbonate. So let's go to question, uh, next question, which is question number six. And question number six is asking, state two solids that may be heated to obtain oxygen gas only. So state two solids that can be heated in order to obtain oxygen gas only. Not any other gas, you heat it to obtain oxygen gas as the only gas that you're going to obtain. So the first solid that will heat to obtain oxygen gas, we can heat potassium permanganate so if we heat potassium permanganate we're going to get uh, we're going to obtain the potassium uh, potassium one oxide plus manganese two oxide and then plus oxygen gas so remember the potassium one oxide is solid the manganese one oxide it's uh, the manganese two oxide rather it's also solid and then plus oxygen gas so that is the first we can heat potassium permanganate to obtain that so apart from that, we can also heat sodium nitrate. If we heat sodium nitrate, we are going to get sodium nitrite plus oxygen gas. Also, we can heat uh, uh, the potassium nitrate. If we heat potassium nitrate, we are going to, to obtain the potassium nitrite plus oxygen gas, among other solids. But the liquids that we can heat, we have different liquids also that you can heat or you can react them in the atmosphere to obtain oxygen gas only. So the first one is the one which is used to prepare oxygen, the laboratory preparation of oxygen gas, whereby we react hydrogen peroxide. So the hydrogen peroxide rather decomposes in atmosphere to form water and oxygen gas. Remember hydrogen peroxide is a liquid. So these are the liquids. So we, hydrogen peroxide decomposes in the atmosphere to form water and oxygen only apart from hydrogen peroxide the other solution we have hypochlorous acid so in hypochlorous acid it also decomposes in atmosphere to form hydrochloric acid plus oxygen gas only so let's go to question number seven is asking study the information below and answer the questions here yeah, study the information below and answer the questions that follows so as you can see, this is a table, and with this table, we have the formula of the compound. We have sodium chloride, we have magnesium chloride, we have aluminium trichloride or aluminium 6 chloride. We have silicon 4 chloride, we have phosphorus 3 chloride, and then we have sulfur, uh, sulfur, we have sulfur dichloride, sulfur dichloride. So the first question is asking, so give two chlorides that are liquid, 
at room temperature and give a reason for your answer. So in this table, give two chlorides that are liquids at room temperature and give a reason for your answer. So the first chloride uh, that is liquid at room temperature, we have sulfur four chloride or sulfur tetrachloride and we also have sulfur dichloride. Why did we give these two as our answers? So the first answer we say that it is sulfur tetrachloride because if you can look at the melting point, what is the melting point? What did you define melting point as? We say that the melting point, this is the point whereby a solid changes to liquid. So that is the melting point. Boiling point, remember you say that this is the point whereby a liquid changes from liquid to, to gas. Now in this case, we selected sulfur tetrachloride having negative 70 degrees Celsius as the melting point. Now, if the temperatures reach negative 70 degrees Celsius, the sulfur tetrachloride is going to change from solid to liquid. And what is the room temperature? So the room temperature varies between 24 degrees Celsius to 28 degrees Celsius. It depends with the different regions of the world. But here, the room temperature varies from 24 degrees Celsius to 28 degrees Celsius. Therefore, if the temperatures reach negative 70 degrees Celsius, it will mean that the sulfur tetrachloride is going to change from being a solid to being a liquid. And remember, the room temperature is, let's say, an average of 24 degrees Celsius. Therefore, it will mean that the sulfur tetrachloride is going to be a liquid. The same same with sulfur, uh, oh, sorry, the other one was silicon tetrachloride. The same same with sulfur dichloride. So sulfur dichloride, the temperature, the melting point is negative 80 degrees Celsius. So it means that when the temperatures hit negative 80 degrees Celsius, the sulfur dichloride is going to change to liquid. Remember the room temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. So negative 80, the solid changed to liquid. Therefore, at 24 degrees Celsius, it's going to be, it's still going to be a liquid. But when you hit 60 degrees Celsius now, the sulfur dichloride is going to be a gas. But in our case, Negative 80, it's going to be a liquid at room temperature. So the next question, which is question letter B, is asking, which two chlorides will remain liquid state for the highest temperature range? If you can look at these uh, six chlorides, in these six chlorides, we are being asked, which two chlorides will remain liquid state for the highest temperature range? Explain. So the two chlorides that will remain the liquid state for the highest temperature range, we have sodium chloride and we also have magnesium chloride. Now this question is just asking about the temperature range. It's not asking about the, any of the matrix, no. It's only asking about the temperature range. So which two chlorides will have the highest temperature range in liquid phase? So the first one we have sodium chloride, whereby if you take your calculator, and you subtract the boiling point, 1470, subtracted with the melting point, which is 800 for sodium chloride, you're going to obtain the temperature range is eight, uh, it's 800, it's 670 degrees Celsius. And for the magnesium, if you calculate 1420 minus 710, uh, 1420 minus 710, you're going to obtain that the temperature range it's 710 degrees Celsius. So it's going to have a very high temperature range. So the answers to this was just checking the temperature range. How do you obtain the temperature range? It's always the highest value minus the lowest value. In this case, you have been given the boiling point and the melting point. Therefore, you're going to subtract the highest boiling point of the specific compound subtracted with the lowest melting point. And you, then you're going to obtain the temperature ranges uh, the compounds that are going to have the maximum or the highest temperature range. So question letter C is asking, state one use of sodium chloride. So state one use of sodium chloride. So sodium chloride, the common salt at home is always sodium chloride. Now this common salt is always referred to as sodium chloride. The salt that you take, the salt that you add in your food to taste, that is always sodium chloride. Chloride. Now this question is asking, state one use of sodium chloride, that salt at home, the table salt. So what is the use of sodium chloride? So the common use of sodium chloride, we see that it is a food additive. So it adds taste to the food that we take. 
So it is a food addi additive. So that is the first use of sodium chloride. So the other use of sodium chloride is that it can also be used to defrost ice. Defrost ice in the high temperature regions, like for example, we have the Greenland, we have the, the United States, those countries that there is permanent snow on their roadsides when it is uh, the time for winter. So sodium chloride is sprinkled on the roads in order to, to accelerate the process by which the ice is going to melt. So remember, in the previous class, we looked at the, uh, the criteria for purity. And, there, and in that topic, remember, we say that for impurities, so impurities, they lower the melting point and they raise the boiling point. So in this case, we are looking at the melting point. If we add sodium chloride to ice, which is snow, if we add sodium chloride to snow, it is going to make the snow melt even faster. So the snow is going to melt even faster. Therefore, sodium chloride in those high temperature countries, they are used to defrost the ice as the second use of sodium chloride. So the other use of sodium chloride is they act as food preservatives, whereby the sodium chloride can be, uh, we can use sodium chloride to preserve food. For example, if we sprinkle some sodium chloride on raw meat, it's going to dehydrate the meat and therefore preserve that meat. Also, if we sprinkle some sodium chloride in raw fish, sodium chloride is going to absorb all the water from the fish and therefore it's going to preserve that fish. So sodium chloride is also used as food preservatives. Also, sodium chloride, we see that the other function of sodium chloride is used in maintaining the blood pressure inside the bodies of living organisms. So sodium chloride is also used to maintain the blood pressure. Apart from that, sodium chloride is also used to transmit different nerve signals inside or between the synapse of the, of the neural junctions, whereby we see that it will work hand in hand with the acetylcholine and the cholesterolkinase. Uh, whereby these ones we are going to learn further as we proceed to form four in the topic of reception, response, and coordination. So those are among the uses of sodium chloride. So let's go to the next question, which is question number eight. So question number eight is asking, we are being asked that the copper two oxide reacts with zinc metal as shown on the whiteboard. So we have the copper metal, copper two oxide rather, reacting with zinc metal as per the equation. So we have the copper two oxide which is solid, reacting with zinc which is solid to get copper which is solid plus zinc oxide. So the question is asking, identify the substance that has been reduced. So the substance in this case that has been reduced is copper two oxide. So this copper two oxide has been reduced to copper. As you can look in the diagram, so in the reactant side we have copper 2 oxide. In the product side we have copper. So the copper 2 oxide has been reduced to copper. So Roman 2 is asking, identify the substance that has been oxidized. So the substance that has been oxidized, in this case we have zinc. So zinc has been oxidized from being a zinc solid to being a zinc oxide solid. So zinc has been oxidized by the copper 2 oxide. So how can we rephrase this? So rephrasing this, we can say that uh, the substance that has been reduced, we can say that the copper 2 oxide has been reduced by zinc metal to copper metal and then zinc has been oxidized by the copper 2 oxide from being zinc metal to being zinc oxide, which is a solid. So in this case, the substance that has been reduced is copper 2 oxide. The copper 2 oxide has been reduced by zinc. And then the substance that has been oxidized in this case is zinc. Zinc has been oxidized. So zinc has been oxidized by, uh, with copper 2 oxide. So zinc has been oxidized with, or rather we can say zinc has been oxidized by copper 2 oxide. So remember, the substance that oxidizes another one is always reduced. So that is what you should always remember. The substance that oxidizes another compound or another element is always reduced. So it is reduced in order to oxidize another substance. 
But we have mentioned these words, oxidize, reduced. They come from the word oxidation and reduction. So if you have been asked to define what is oxidation or reduction, what can you say? So for the oxidation, we'll say that oxidation, this is the process whereby an element gains oxygen, loses electrons, and as well loses hydrogen atoms or hydrogen ions. And reduction, if you have been asked to compare them, so that is oxidation. So oxidation, remember you say that the substance gain the element. The element gains oxygen. It also gains the oxidation number. And as well, it loses electrons and also loses hydrogen ions. So that is the definition of oxidation. And what about the definition of reduction? So the definition of reduction will say that reduction, this is the process whereby there is the loss of oxygen and then there is also the loss of or the reduction of the oxidation number. Then there is the gaining of electrons and the gaining of hydrogen ions. So that is reduction. So if you have been asked in an exam, differentiate between oxidation and reduction and say that oxidation this is the process whereby an element gains oxygen, gains oxidation number, but then it loses electrons and loses hydrogen ions, while reduction, this is the process whereby an element loses oxygen and it also loses or reduces its oxidation number, gains electrons and also gains hydrogen ions. So that's the definition between what we are discussing now, which is oxidation and reduction. So this oxidation and reduction, we see that it comes from a type of reaction which is referred to as the redox reactions. So the redox reactions, as we proceed to form three, we are going to look at the different types of redox reaction. And this one is an example of a redox reaction, whereby one, uh, like one compound or one element, oxidizes the other as it is being reduced. So this is a type of redox reaction. So let's go to the next number, which is number nine. So number nine is asking, an element B burns in air to form an oxide of B, which then dissolves in water to form a solution that turns the blue litmus paper red. So if it turns the blue litmus paper to red, it will mean that it is an acidic solution. It is an acidic solution because the blue litmus has turned color from blue to red. So in brackets, we are being told that B is not the actual symbol of the element. So B is just a value or it's just a letter given to this element. So the question is asking, is B a metal or a non-metal? Give a reason for your answer. So let's look at the question one more time to understand the question better. So I've been asked that this element that you have been given, this element, so this element, we react it with oxygen. So this element, like <laughs> this tub, let's say this tub is the element. So we have reacted this tub with oxygen. So if we react it with oxygen, we are going to form an oxide, an oxide of B in this case. Now we have an oxide of B because we have reacted it with oxygen. So this B oxide, we again react it with, with water. So if we react this B with water, we are going to get a solution. Now this solution that you have obtained from reacting with water, this solution, if we dip a blue litmus paper, that litmus paper changes color from blue to red. Now the question is asking, is B a metal or a non-metal? So the characteristic of the litmus paper is the one which is going to tell us if B is a metal or a non-metal. So going back to the periodic table, so the periodic table, remember, it has 20 elements from hydrogen, the 10th element is always a neon, and the 20th element is always calcium. So looking at the 20 elements of the periodic table, remember, we have different groups from group one, which are referred to as the alkali metals. We have group two, which are referred to as the alkaline earth metals. We have group four, which are always referred to as the metalloids or the charcoals. We have group seven, which are referred to as the halogens or the salt producers. And then lastly, we have group number eight, which are referred to as the noble gases, rare gases, or the inert gases. So remember, we looked at inert gases in the previous video. This term inert, what does the term inert mean? So we say that inert means unreactive. 
So if you have been asked, if you have been told that they are inert, it means that and reactive. That's the meaning of inert. Apart from the groups, remember we say that we had periods. So we had period one, period two, period three, period four, period five, and period six in the periodic table. So we went to a subtopic which was strengths and properties across period three elements, if you can be able to remember. So in these strengths and properties across period three elements, remember period three elements, we have the metals and the non-metals. So for the period three elements, we had sodium, we had magnesium, we had aluminium, we had silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and lastly we had argon, which is uh, atomic number 18. So it has 18 protons in the nucleus of its, uh, of its structure. So looking at these period three elements, from sodium to magnesium, these are metals. Now from phosphorus to argon, these are non-metals. So they behave differently. The metals behave differently. The pH, the pH for the metals is different when dissolved in water. And for the non-metals, the pH is also different when dissolved in, in water. So let's look at, first of all, the metal oxides from sodium, magnesium, aluminum. So the metal oxide. So if you react sodium, we are reacting sodium with oxygen, we are going to get sodium, uh, sodium oxide. So this sodium oxide, if we react sodium oxide with water, we are going to get sodium hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide, since it is an hydroxide, it will mean that it is basic in nature. Basic in nature means that it will turn the red litmus paper from red to blue. So if it, if it will turn the red litmus paper to blue, it will mean that it is, uh, it is a basic solution. The same as magnesium. If we react magnesium with oxygen, we're going to get magnesium oxide. So if we react magnesium oxide with water, we're going to obtain magnesium hydroxide, which is basic in nature. Let's go to aluminum. So if we react aluminum with oxygen, we're going to get aluminum trioxide. Now this aluminum trioxide, if we react it with water, we are going to get aluminum hydroxide. The aluminum hydroxide is basic in nature since it turns the red litmus paper to blue. If we break down also into ions, you are going to see that it has a, an OH whereby it is an hydroxyl. So those are the metals. Remember the metallic oxide, they are basic in nature. So let's look at the non-metallic side still across the period three elements. So from silicon, we go to phosphorus. So if we react phosphorus with oxygen, we are going to obtain two oxides, whereby the first oxide is phosphorus tetraoxide or phosphorus trioxide. And also we are going to obtain phosphorus pentoxide or phosphorus 5 oxide. So let's look at phosphorus trioxide. If we react phosphorus trioxide with water, uh, we are going to obtain an acidic solution, which is uh, phosphor is phosphor phosphoric is phosphorus acid. So if we react phosphorus three uh, oxide plus water, we are going to obtain phosphorus acid, which is H3PO3 phosphorus acid. Now, if we react phosphorus five oxide plus water, we are going to obtain phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4. So this H3PO4, if we take the blue litmus paper and dip it in this solution, we are going to obtain an acidic solution. So let's go to the next. From phosphorus, we go to sulfur, whereby sulfur is atomic number 16, phosphorus is atomic number 15. So if we react sulfur with oxygen, we are going to obtain two oxides. So we are going to obtain sulfur 4 oxide or sulfur 6 oxide. We are also going to obtain sulfur 2 oxide, but let's base our argument on sulfur 4 oxide and sulfur 6 oxide. So if sulfur 4 oxide dissolves in water, uh, we are going to obtain sul sulfurous acid. So we are going to obtain sulfurous acid. So sulfurous acid is now the H3SO3, that is sulfurous acid. But if we react sulfur 6 oxide plus water, we are going to obtain 
sulfuric acid which is H2SO4 is sulfuric acid so this sulfuric acid if you take the blue the red litmus paper and dip it in this solution these two solutions we are going to obtain an acidic solution whereby the blue litmus paper is going to change color to red in color the same same with chlorine if we react chlorine with oxygen the process is also going to be the same so in this case trends across period three elements if we react the met the metallic oxides with water we are going to obtain a basic solution if we react the non-metallic oxide with water we are going to obtain an acidic solution now let's go back to our question number nine so our question number nine was asking an element b burns in air to form an oxide of b we have element b we burn it in in oxygen we form an oxide of b so the oxide of b dissolves in water to form a solution that turns the blue litmus paper to red so we have been told that b is not the actual symbol of the element so is element b a metal or a non-metal so if the solution turns the blue litmus paper to red it will mean that the ph is acidic and in the previous explanation we say that the non -met the non-metallic oxide when dissolved in water they form an acidic solution so in this case b is a non-metal explain your answer b is a non-metal because the oxide of b reacts with water to form an acidic solution which turns the blue litmus paper to red so that's our answer so b is a non-metal because it's only the non-metals that the non-metallic oxides that dissolve in water to form an acidic solution so let's go to question number 10. So question number 10 is asking, study the diagram below and answer the questions that follows. As you can see, that is the diagram. So in that diagram, you can see we have wet sand. Apart from wet sand, we have heat, whereby the heat is heating the iron wool and as well is heating the wet sand. Then we have that delivery tube and then the gas is collected using the overwater method as gas J. So question number A, question letter A is asking, name gas J. So what is gas J? Gas J is hydrogen gas. Why is gas J hydrogen gas? Let's look at the wet sand. The wet sand is being heated. So if we heat the wet sand, what is going to be produced? So the wet sand is going to produce steam. It is wet, meaning that it has some moisture, it has some water. So if we heat the wet sand, it's going to produce steam. Then remember, we are also heating iron. So it, it will mean that the iron is going to react with steam. What is the state symbol for steam? The state symbol of steam, steam remember, we say that it is H2O, then G, to symbolize that it is a gas. So the state symbol of water in liquid form is L, H2O, L. But the state symbol for steam is H2O and then uh, G, meaning that it is a gas. So that's the state symbol of steam. So in this case, we are reacting iron with steam, water in form of vapor. So if you react iron with steam, as per the equation, we see that you are going to obtain iron 3 oxide plus hydrogen gas. So that is the equation, and that is where we are obtaining the hydrogen gas from. We are reacting iron plus water in gas form, which is steam, so if you react these two, we're going to obtain uh, ion 3 oxide, as you can see, plus uh, hydrogen gas. So the hydrogen gas will be obtained using that method, which is overwater method. Why is it collected using the overwater method? We say that it is because hydrogen is insoluble in cold water. Well, uh, in this case, the water has not been labeled warm or cold. So hydrogen is insoluble in cold water, and then hydrogen is also a very light gas, or you can say it is a less denser gas. So explain why it is important to heat the wet sand before heating the iron wool. So why, sh first of all, should we heat the wet sand before heating the iron wool? So the reason is because we are heating the wet sand in order to generate steam to react with the iron. So that is the reason. We are heating the wet sand in order to generate the steam. Also, we are heating the wet sand. The other reason is that we are heating the wet sand in order to drive out the air that is inside the boiling tube. 
so to drive out the air so that the ion will react with the steam that is incoming so we have those two reasons so the first reason is to generate steam the second reason is to drive out the air inside the boiling tube to re, uh, in order for steam to react with iron so that's the reason so the next which is uh, c is asking state one observation made in the combustion tube as heating is carried out so state one reason observed in the combustion tube as the process of heating is taking place so we see that iron glows red in color so that's the first observation so iron glows red in color if you heat iron iron always glows red so that is the first observation so iron glows red so the second observation will say that uh, uh, the color of iron changed from gray to black so that is the second observation so the color of iron changed from gray to black so that black iron implied that it formed iron 3 oxide so iron is gray in color iron 3 oxide is black in color and that's that's what gives us the basis of saying that the color of iron changed from gray to uh, to black so the next question is asking state two differences between permanent and temporary changes so like what are the difference between permanent and temporary changes or rather what are the other names of permanent or temporary change so the other name of permanent change might be called a uh, chemical change the other name of temporary change might be called um, a physical change so there is another name of permanent change so the other name of permanent change or the chemical change might be called irreversible change the other name of temporary change we can call it reversible change so the question is asking what are the differences between a permanent and a temporary change so the permanent change we see that we always form a new substance in permanent change like for example rusting is a permanent change if an iron rusts even if you remove the brown color on top of iron but still the iron will have rusted inside the iron there will be still that hydrated iron three molecules impeded inside the rust so you see that in permanent change a new substance is formed while in temporary change there is no new substance that is formed so in permanent change we see that permanent changes are always irreversible so you can't go back to the original products for the permanent change for the temporary change we see that it is irreversible so it is very easy for you to reverse the temporary change and also for the permanent change we see that there is always the change in mass there's always the change in mass in permanent change well for the temporary change there is no change in mass so if for example you mixed between two substances one substance was 5 kg the next one was 2 kg after you mix them you're going to obtain the net uh, weight which is 5 plus 2 is also going it's always going to be 7 kg so there's not there's not going to be any change in mass in temporary change also in permanent change we see that it is always accompanied by heat changes so the temperatures might increase or might decrease in permanent changes it is always accompanied by heat changes while in temporary change there is no accompaniment of heat changes so that is all about the permanent and the temporary changes it's so simple like that so the question number 12 is asking so the table below gives some properties of substances i j and k as you can see the table so study it and answer the questions that follow so there you can see we have the substance we have the melting point solubility in water then finally electrical conductivity in solid state and the next one in molten state of i j and k so question number a is asking suggest the type of structure in i so as we can look at the i we see that i has a melting a very high melting point of 1063 it is insoluble in water and it conducts electricity in solid state and also in molten state it conducts electricity remember it is insoluble in in water so element j on the other hand we see that it has a melting point of 113 degrees celsius it is insoluble in water it doesn't conduct electricity in solid state and it doesn't conduct electricity in liquid state most likely it can be wood or paper etc 
So let's look at element K. So element K has a melting point of 402 degrees Celsius. It is sparingly soluble in water, meaning that it is slightly soluble in water. It doesn't conduct electricity in solid state, but conducts electricity in liquid state. So the first question is asking, suggest the type of structure in I. So as we can look at the I, I conducts electricity in solid state. It also conducts electricity in liquid state. So automatically, I becomes a metal. So it is only metals that have very high melting point and boiling point they are insoluble in water and they conduct electricity in liquid and in solid state. It is only metals. So in this case, <clears throat> in this case, we have been asked, suggest the structure. So if it's, if it's the structure they are asking for, so the structure, it's giant metallic structure. That is the structure for I. So suggest the structure uh, found in I. So the structure, remember, it's giant metallic structure that's the structure and why did we say that because it has a very high melting point and also it is insoluble in water it conducts electricity in solid state and also in molten or liquid state so that must be a metal so suggest the type of structure in k so what's the structure in k the structure in k that is giant ionic structure why did we say it's giant ionic structure it is only ionic structures only ionic structures that conduct electricity in molten state and not in solid state so it is only and only ionic structures that conduct electricity in solid in molten state or in aqueous state and not in solid state so due to that this one is a is a is an ionic compound so the structure is giant ionic structure so let's look at the examples of ionic structure. The ionic structure, we have uh, sodium chloride, we have magnesium chloride, we have zinc oxide, we have something like aluminium trioxide. So why did we say that these are ionic structures? So they are ionic structures because if we take a look at the types of bonds that we had looked earlier, so we saw that we have different types of bonds. We say that we have covalent bond. A covalent bond, remember we say that, these are bond formed between non-metals. So if non-metals react to form a compound, that is a covalent bond. Example, we have oxygen. Like you can see, if oxygen reacts with oxygen, we are going to get an oxygen molecule. So this is how you show the covalent structure. So by drawing the circles and then representing them with X's. So that is how you show covalent structure. But how do you show ionic structure? So remember, an ionic bond, this is a bond formed between metals and non-metals. For the covalent, remember we say that it's formed between non-metals reacting with non-metals. So ionic structures, they are formed when metals react with non-metals. That's why we gave an example of sodium and oxygen, sodium oxide, sodium chloride, magnesium oxide, magnesium chloride, because Sodium is a metal, that oxygen from the oxide is a non-metal. Sodium is a metal, that chlorine from the chloride, or rather, that chloride from chlorine is a non-metal. So if they come together, that type of bond is referred to as an ionic bond. If we have been asked about that structure, that structure will be referred to as giant ionic structures. So apart from that, we, we went to metallic bonds and we looked at metallic bonds. Apart from that, we saw that we also have dative bond or coordinate bond. So if you have been asked, define dative bond or coordinate bond, what will you say? So a dative or a coordinate bond, this is whereby one atom donates two electrons to be shared. So if one atom donates two electrons to be shared, that is a dative bond or a coordinate bond. Because... Uh, before the because, uh, you can be asked that or you can be asked to explain why dative bond is a special type of covalent bond. Or you can be asked, explain why coordinate bond is a special type of, uh, is a special type of covalent bond. So why is it a special type of covalent bond? It's because, uh, like for the covalent bond, we see that both atoms donate two electrons to be shared. 
but in the coordinate bond we see that one atom donates two electrons to be shared that is the only difference in covalent bond both atom donates electrons equally to be shared for the bond but for the coordinate or dative bond one atom donates two electrons to be shared in order to form the bond so those are the types of bonds that we have remember so in k remember we had been asked suggest the type of structure found in k so in k we have the giant ionic structures that is the structure found in k why because the ionic structures remember you say that is formed between a metal and a non-metal so let's go to letter b question letter b is asking explain why molten k is decomposed by current but i is not decomposed by electric current so explain why k is decomposed by electric current uh, while i is not decomposed so the answer is very simple so you see k k is an ionic structure therefore ionic structures are decomposed by electric current whereas metallic structures are elements and therefore they are not decomposed by electric current i'll refresh that answer you'll say that i is not decomposed by electric current because it is an element whereas k is decomposed by electric current because it is an ionic compound so that is the answer so why is it that k is decomposed by electric current so k will be decomposed by electric current because if you look at the topic of energy changes yeah the topic of energy changes or electric current on substances you will see that ionic compounds are basically decomposed by electric current this is by using different electrodes inside the electrolyte what did you say electrolyte is we say that an electrolyte this is a liquid under electrolysis or under electrolysis process so the liquid uh, uh, the liquid that is under electrolysis process is referred to as an electrolyte and then for this chemical cell remember we must use different electrodes we can use uh, the carbon electrodes you can use copper electrodes you can use zinc electrodes we can use lead electrodes it depends with the different types of electrolyte that you are using so explain why molten case decomposed by current by i is not decomposed so the answer to this we say that i will not be decomposed because it is an element k will be decomposed because it is a compound so that is that